is Dr. Marty Freed and Dr. Shreya Trivedi. This is the Core IM Five Pearls Podcast, brought to you by Clinical Correlations, bringing you high yield, evidence based pearls. Today, we're talking about headaches. A very special thank you to Dr. Minnan, a neurologist and a headache specialist who serves on the editorial board of the journal Headache. She has peer reviewed this podcast as well as Dr. Vincent Cintillo, an internal medicine physician at NYU. All right, let's get started with five questions on the pearls we'll be covering. Number one, indications for imaging in patients complaining of headaches. What headache features and in which demographics would you consider imaging for headaches? Number two, abortive therapy in migraines. How do you choose your options for acute treatment of migraines? Number three, Medication overuse headache. At what medication frequencies and what type of change in the headache do you consider medication overuse? Number four, migraine prophylaxis. When do you start thinking of putting your patients on preventive therapy for their migraines and what do you start? Number five, non-pharmacological therapies for migraine. So what are things that are not medications and have shown to be efficacious for migraines? Let's jump into it, Marty. So the vast majority of headaches a PCP is going to see are going to be primary headaches. So the majority is going to be tension type, about 70%, and then 16% of them are going to be migraines, and less than 1% is going to be the much rarer cluster headache. That being said, we should always look out for red flags. For sure, Shreya. Red flags are clues that there might be a secondary headache going on and we might need imaging. I think a good way to think about this is to separate concerning patient conditions from concerning headache features. Concerning patient conditions are serious medical conditions in our patients. So a headache in a patient with a known diagnosis of cancer or a patient with HIV. A patient with a history of seizures is also concerning. And don't forget about age. A new headache in a patient greater than age 50 is concerning for a new mass lesion. Yes, I am definitely more cautious in patients with those demographics. But Marty, tell me, what are some headache features I should be looking out for? So concerning headache features are obvious things like constitutional symptoms, including weight loss and fever. New neurologic signs are obviously worrisome, and this includes papilledema, so sometimes you do have to bust out that fundoscope. Always ask about headache triggers like coughing, exertion, or sex, as these features are worrisome for a mass. Ask your patient if the headache wakes them up from sleep. And finally, a changing headache is a concerning headache, and that may warrant a scan. Yep, particularly if the changing feature of the headache is the worst headache of their life or an acute thunderclap headache. In those scenarios, you want to be concerned for the possibility of an aneurysmal bleed. Exactly. So to recap, you should watch for key features while taking a history. A new headache in someone older than 50, a headache that wakes them up from sleep associated with weight loss or fever, or if it's positional, if the headache is occurring with sex or cough, and always think about immunocompromised status. And if there is a red flag sign? Do not pass go. Go directly to imaging. Of course. Now, how do I choose between CT versus MRI? Fortunately, there is great expert guidance available. The American Headache Society's Choosing Wisely list gives us some helpful insight. They tell us, don't perform CT imaging for headache when MRI is available, except in emergency settings. So if you're looking for bleeding or an acute stroke, CT imaging is actually excellent. But in the primary care office, if a patient has red flag signs, we're really concerned about mass lesions or vascular disease. And for these, CT just isn't sensitive enough. For these, we do need MR imaging. Okay, Marty. So we talked about red flag signs and the possible need for imaging. But in our approach to headaches, we should also always consider secondary causes of headaches. So I'm thinking about obstructive sleep apnea leading to morning headaches or sinusitis associated with frontal headaches. Or did the patient have a trauma and this headache is a part of a post-concussive syndrome? These are some things we should think about and rule out. All right, we've ruled out any red flag signs or other secondary causes of headache. You determine it's a migraine. Then what? Then treat. 
So for abortive therapy, you either want to categorize the migraine as mild to moderate or moderate to severe. If it's mild to moderate, then your first line options are NSAIDs. So naproxen, ibuprofen, personally, I prefer naproxen because it's longer lasting. It can be given every 12 hours versus ibuprofen, which is every six to eight hours. And what about just acetaminophen? So in studies, at least, acetaminophen alone is shown not to be effective for acute migraines. So typically, we usually don't use it to treat true migraines. Good to know. Then what if my patient doesn't respond well to NSAIDs or on our first meeting has moderate to severe headache? Right. Then think about triptans. You want to be careful, though, because triptans do have vasoconstrictive properties. So be cautious in starting in patients with ischemic heart disease or stroke or uncontrolled hypertension. But if their blood pressure is controlled, then triptans can be given. Of all the oral triptans, a meta-analysis actually found rizotriptan, elotriptan, and elmotriptan to be the three most effective. So if those are in your hospital formulary, that's a win. In terms of the starting dose, some neurologists say they even start at a full triptan dose because there have been studies to show that if patients try it at a lower dose and it doesn't work for them, then patients are often not likely going to comply with a higher dose. Mm, Interesting. So what if that full dose of triptan I prescribed doesn't work? Luckily, treatment failure does not seem to be a class effect. So if patients don't respond to one triptan, they might respond to another. There are actually seven triptan options, which I didn't even know myself. So switching triptans is very reasonable. I have had patients say it's life-saving when they do find the triptan that works for them. Definitely, definitely. When we're talking about the benefits of abortive therapy, tell me about the flip side of it, medication overuse headache. Right. So a medication overuse headache is going to happen in patients with a pre-existing headache disorder who's been using these abortive acute medications in high, high frequency, such that the headache changes from episodic to chronic and daily in nature. This is sometimes referred to as chronification. Okay. So we should be looking for increased frequency of headache and high use abortive meds. Yes, specifically if their episodic headache is such that it's changed to chronic, meaning 15 or more days a month. Yikes. So how much medication does it take to cause an overuse headache? Are all abortive medications the same in this respect? No, no, no. So different meds are going to cause overuse headache with different frequencies of use. For example, the American Migraine Prevalence and Prevention Study demonstrated that this chronification of the headache is most likely to occur with five days of butyl use per month, which is a component of furacet. So be careful with that. There's also a a, a risk increased with more than eight days of opioid use per month, greater than 10 days of triptans per month, and 10 to 15 days of NSAIDs per month. So for these reasons, opioids and butyl butyl should probably be avoided and acute migraine prescriptions are best limited to two days a week. Definitely be careful with Fioraset or honestly just try to avoid it altogether. The two day per week recommendation is difficult because I don't want my patients to be scared of using their medication a third time in one week if they've already used it twice. So what I counsel them is at this point, go ahead and use it for the third time and then the next week only try to use it once. But honestly, if your patient is using this much abortive therapy, then maybe it's time to start thinking about prophylaxis. Yes, perfect segue. So if your patient is experiencing effects of an overuse headache from acute medication, the treatment is to stop the abortive therapy and start prophylaxis. So other times I'll start thinking about prophylaxis is, number one, if they have any contraindications to the acute medication, or two, if despite managing their triggers or appropriate use of abortive therapy, the patient still says, Hey, doc, I'm having these frequent headaches still, especially if they're four or more headaches a month. Or he or she says, hey, doc, I'm still having these horrible migraine attacks. They're really interfering with my daily life. I'm not able to go to work or not able to take care of my kids well. In these situations, you want to start or add migraine prevention meds. Right. So sometimes with Sometimes patients with frequent and severe headaches require both abortive and preventative medicines. So I offer prophylaxis if the patient is experiencing headache more than four times per month or if the headaches are interfering with daily life. So there are tons of options for migraine prophylaxis, Rhea. How do I choose one? Yes, a number to choose from. 
But in terms of trial data on prophylaxis, the ones with established efficacy are anti-epileptics, so divalproics and topiramate, and beta blockers, particularly metoprolol and propranolol. The ones with probable efficacy are amitriptyline and atenolol, and ARBs such as candesartan. Lastly, meds like lisinopril and calcium channel blockers have shown to possibly be effective. All right, so first reach for antiepileptics like topiramate and valproate, or the beta blockers, specifically metoprolol and propranolol. And isn't there a great side effect from topiramate? Ah, uh, yes. It's important to note when starting migraine prophylaxis to educate our patients on what defines success. So neurologists consider it to be a success if the migraine frequency or the number of days of migraines is reduced by 50% in three months. Good to know. It is so important to set expectations for our patients. I explicitly discuss this with every one of my headache patients whom I'm starting prophylactic meds on. The goal is usually to decrease symptoms by half if they stick with it for at least two to three months. So Marty, I had this patient who told me all about her long struggle with headaches, uh, and I go to tell her the plan, and she stops me and says that she has no interest at all taking any more pills. And I'm like, wait, you just spend 30 minutes telling me all about your terrible headache. Don't you want something? So what do I do in those situations where my patient's really suffering but doesn't want any meds? That is so frustrating. We've definitely all been there. A great plan only works if the patient agrees, but good for her. There are actually tons of great options of non-pharmacologic therapies that have been studied with good efficacy. I would love to hear about it. I definitely did not feel as confident in my treatment plan without the meds that I've known to work. So for this, I'll point our listeners towards a great paper published in Continuum, which is the official review article journal of the American Academy of Neurology that describes non-pharmacologic treatment options. We'll list the paper in the show notes. There are tons of great options out there, but two great options are cognitive behavioral therapy and progressive muscle relaxation therapy. They are both level A evidence-based preventative treatments. Tell me more about them. Progressive muscle relaxation is a technique that teaches you how to relax muscles with a purposeful systematic tension followed by relaxation. This alternation between tension and relaxation has been shown in prospective studies to reduce the frequency of migraines. What's cool is that there's tons of apps out there that our patients can download to their phone and try these exercises at home. Next is CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So many of our listeners will remember that CBT is a type of psychotherapy that helps patients address destructive patterns of thinking and behavior. Randomized trials demonstrate the efficacy of CBT alone or in combination with progressive muscle relaxation. All right, but what about my underserved patient who doesn't have access to good CBT or, say, my grandpa who can't use these apps? Totally, totally. So don't forget aerobic exercise and sleep. So in terms of, aer of aerobic exercise, a large observational study demonstrated that low physical activity was associated with a higher prevalence of migraines than those who exercised more. A follow-up experiment showed that 40 minutes of indoor cycling three times a week was equally as effective at migraine prophylaxis compared with topiramate and re relaxation techniques. So that's exercise. And then sleep. A regular sleep schedule is so crucial to prevent migraines. That is so empowering to hear. Now that I know that there's good evidence behind it, I'll definitely feel more confident in the future talking to my patients about exercising and relaxation for migraines. All right, let's review some key points from our discussion on headaches. Think about patient characteristics and headache qualities to determine if your patient's headaches require imaging to look for a secondary cause. Important paper patient characteristics are age and comorbidities. Worrisome headache qualities are headache that awake patients from sleep and a changing headache. Remember that unless you're looking for a bleed, MRI is the preferred imaging modality. NSAIDs are the first line abortive therapy for both tension and migraine headaches. And when NSAIDs don't work, triptans are a useful abortive therapy. Remember to start at a full dose and don't be scared to try multiple types of triptans if the first one fails to help your patient. Totally. And be alert for medication overuse headache, especially if you notice your patient's headache changing from intermittent to a chronic daily headache in the context of using lots of abortive therapy medications. To avoid this, encourage your patient to limit triptans and NSAIDs to less than two times per week on average. That's right. And if they're still getting headaches requiring abortive therapy more than two times a week, then it's probably time to start offering them prophylaxis. 
Beta blockers like propranolol and anti-seizure meds like topiramate are the mainstay migraine prophylaxis. And finally, other than medication prophylaxis, there's good data to support non-pharmacologic headache prophylaxis like cognitive behavioral therapy, progressive muscle relaxation, biofeedback, regular sleep, and don't forget exercise. So true. The simplest solutions are sometimes the best. Agreed. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please email at us at fivepearlspodcast at gmail.com or tweet at us at marty underscore freed or shreya trevetti md. Opinions expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent the opinions of NYU or other affiliated institutions. Do not use this podcast for medical advice. Instead, see your own healthcare provider for medical care. All right. Until next time. See you later. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Corient. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Corient has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Corient has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com.